Hello once again everyone, this is Record here. And boy are we in for a wild ride here with example two from section 3.6, Larson's ninth edition textbook. We're now into the full-blown curve sketching, which um, is sort of uh, a topic that students have had a love-hate relationship with. The love part of it is the fact that really you're not doing anything new. Um, you're just kind of getting a chance to recap all of the skills that you've learned leading up to section 3.6. The hate part of it is that these problems do take a little bit of time because you're performing a thorough analysis. And uh, as you can see, uh, there are nine different things that uh, you would have to be able to do to really get to a point where you can effectively sketch a graph of these functions. So without further ado, we're going to dive right into example 2a, where we are to sketch a graph of the function f of x equaling 2 quantity x squared minus 9 all over x squared minus 4. So we're going to start it just step by step. Uh, part 1 says to find the x and y intercepts. That's a topic from Algebra 1. So I'm going to go to a, a different page for each of these uh, individual pieces and we'll tick, uh, just knock them off one by one. So in order to find the x and y intercepts, well, it doesn't matter really which one you find first. Let's say that we want to find the y intercept initially. Not much uh, we got to worry about here other than the fact that we will uh, set the x value equal to 0. So basically finding f of 0 will get the job done here. So if we plug 0 in for the x, we would get 2 times negative 9 all over 0 minus 4. So that would be a negative 18 divided by negative 4 or 9 over 2. And we could file that away as an ordered pair if we wanted to, 0 comma 9.2 or 0 comma 4 and a half, however, I'm sorry, 0 comma 9 halves or 0 comma 4 and a half. And then we're going to go ahead and find the other types of intercepts. Those would be the x-intercepts. So in finding the x-intercepts, we would do something a little bit different here. We're going to then set the entire function equal to 0. But when we set this entire function equal to zero, since it is a fraction, we really don't have to worry about much of what's going on in the denominator because only when the top is equal to zero will the function equal zero. And as you can see, if you divide both sides by two, you're really dealing with the fact that x squared minus nine is zero. So that obviously would make x equal to three or negative three. So we could file those away as a pair of x-intercepts. So we'll have to come back to those later when we start putting together our sketch. Now part two, it says that this is an optional part. Um, I say optional only because it will not make or break the fact that you can, whether or not you can sketch it or not. Um, it is a nice sort of um, fallback. For instance, if you put the graph together and you think, hey, I see kind of some kind of a symmetry relationship going on, you can kind of revisit this and say, hey, it was supposed to have that relationship. So. What we're looking for here right now is whether or not there is any y-axis symmetry or origin symmetry. And as you can see over here to the right in the box, I've summarized the two types of symmetry. Number one, symmetry with respect to the y-axis will exist if f of negative x is equal to f of x. Well, you might remember from a previous conversation that we said that that's the same thing as f of x being an even function. So you might ask, well, what is an even function? consist of? Well, it does truly consist of exponents that would all be even numbers in the case of some kind of a rational function like we have. And that's indeed what we've got going on in, in example 2a. You know, to verify that, if we wanted to say, well, what is f of negative x? Just to verify, well, if you replace each of the x values with a negative x, we would see that we've got something that will resemble exactly what we started with because any negative that's going to end up being squared is really going to go away. And that happens both in the numerator and the denominator. So we do have some nice symmetry with respect to the origin in this case. I'm sorry, <laughs> let me take that back. We have symmetry with respect to the y-axis. So we'll go ahead and record that. Symmetric with respect to the y-axis. And like I say, we'll file that away for future reference and just verify it once we've sketched the graph. 
So now that those two things are taken care of, we'll move on to our third idea, which is the concept of domain of the function, which again, you can see I put a star here for optional, and I've only done that because we typically will take care of the domain as we also take care of part four here, any discontinuities. So what we're looking at here for the domain is just to kind of investigate the function and say, hmm, do we have any things that we need to really be on alert for? For example, do we have a denominator? In this case, we obviously do. We have a denominator of x squared minus 4, and we must all recall that we cannot have our denominators, or in this case, we cannot have our x squared minus 4 being equal to 0. Now, other things for the domain that you might want to look out for are square roots or even roots, and the fact that the contents underneath a square root cannot be equal to a negative number. But a lot of times, uh, the domain issue sort of works itself out when you get to your first derivative test. So once again, that's why I've made that an optional. But it's pretty clear here that you can see that x being 2 or negative 2 are things that we cannot have. But it seems like everything else seems to be full, uh, full go. So we're going to go ahead and say that the domain would be any values besides negative 2 and positive 2. So we could write that in nice, handy interval notation such as this. And then we can file that away for future reference. Now, the good thing about number 4 is the fact we have already done number 4. The discontinuities that we've discussed are at 2 and negative 2. And we are pretty certain that those are, um, well, do you have to really classify them? That's a good question. Are they removable discontinuities? Are they non-removable? Well, if you remember back from an earlier discussion we've had, we said that if you end up with denominator, in this case, an x squared minus 4 that could factor into x minus 2x plus 2, if there is no way that that denominator or any part of that denominator will cancel away, then those things are going to be classified as non-removable discontinuities. I really don't care so much if my students do not classify these because it's going to be revealed later on, in fact, in part five, um, of what kind of discontinuities that they are. But you can start to see how all of this comes together now. In part five, we now see that we are finding the equations of any vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, or oblique asymptotes. Now, this is going to cause for a little bit of thinking because there are three completely different ways in which to find these kinds of asymptotes. First of all, for the vertical asymptotes, which I will abbreviate as VA, what we must remember is the relationship between finding these and finding discontinuities because it's very, very similar. In fact, we found a couple of discontinuities in part four that were non-removable, and hence they are typically non-removable because they would be the equation of a vertical asymptote. So basically, if you have a denominator that will not cancel away, then you've got yourself some vertical asymptotes. So if we go ahead and solve this for x, we get x equal 2 and x equal negative 2, which will show up as our two equations of the vertical asymptotes. Now if you go on to the next kind of asymptote mentioned here, the horizontal asymptote, we then must remember what we learned uh, in section 3.5 of our textbook. That would be the finding of limits as x approaches infinity or as x approaches negative infinity. Because this is indeed what is going on with regards to finding horizontal asymptotes. We could find either that limit or we could find either, we could find this limit. And whatever answers we get from this will end up being our, and I don't know why I put zero there, so let's get rid of him. <laughs> Whatever we find from these two limits, we will then declare as our horizontal asymptote. So once again, we have to sort of put our thinking cap on and think, okay, how do we go about doing this now? Well, once again, take a look at the function, and the shortcut for this is to analyze the degree of the numerator and the denominator. In this case, they're both two and any time that the degrees match of the numerator and the denominator, then the shortcut way to finding the limit as you approach infinity, or negative infinity for that matter, is to divide the coefficient that resides in front of that x squared in this case in the numerator by the coefficient that resides 
in front of the x squared in the denominator. So in this particular instance, we have 2 divided by 1. Well, that would make our limit 2 in both cases. Now, you might recall that there are times that a limit as you approach infinity and negative infinity do yield different answers. But for the examples that we've discussed in class, those are typically reserved for uh, rational expressions that may have a square root um, either in the top or in the bottom. There are some other instances I will not get into at this point. But for a standard rational function that's polynomial over polynomial, these two limits you can pretty much guarantee that will be equal to one another. So that would then lead us to say that the horizontal line y equal 2 will be the equation of our horizontal asymptote. For our final type of asymptote, the oblique asymptote, perhaps you may have seen a previous uh, video that I had demonstrated. Uh, it's entitled Section 3.6, Example 1. I outlined how to find uh, an oblique asymptote by using polynomial long division, but yet in this particular case, that will not even apply because you must have a degree in the numerator that is one larger than the degree into the denominator before any kind of division could yield a first degree x result. Uh, bottom line is, if you've got a horizontal asymptote, you're not going to ever have an oblique asymptote. So this is not applicable, and we can then just move on. So that takes us to number six, which, hey, a little bit of calculus will finally enter the picture. I put six and seven here together because they do go hand in hand, especially with the way that I've been teaching this to my students. We're going to sort of construct our nice little integral chart here. So in order to find the intervals of increasing and decreasing, we must use the first derivative test. So that means we will take the derivative of this guy. And it's really up to you how you want to handle this. Um, do you distribute the two? Do you leave the two out in front? I don't think there's any problem if we just leave the two out in front. I'm going to, of the x squared minus 9 in this case, I'm going to go ahead and use the quotient rule. And I'll probably go through this pretty quickly. This is a long video, but feel free to pause and or rewind as you see fit. So in using the quotient rule, we're going to take the derivative of the top, which would be 2 times 2x. And we'll multiply that by the denominator, x squared minus 4. And then we will subtract the numerator, and then multiply by the derivative of the denominator. And we must remember that all of this would be placed above the denominator squared. Sometimes the algebra involved in simplifying these derivatives is just as key and maybe as difficult or more than the calculus. And it's very important that we do that type of simplifying. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to find the critical numbers here. So I see that we can factor some things out of the numerator, namely a 2, a 2x, and what looks to be an x squared minus 4. So we have that factored out in front. And we see what's going to be left over, and we have a 1 minus let's see, did I make a mistake here? 2, derivative of the top. Ah, yes, yes, I'm thinking, what's going on here? I apologize. Let's go ahead and make this adjustment here. I think we're going to get 0 in this numerator. I should have, I want to say, a 9 right here. So let's recap that derivative here. I've got the derivative of the first piece, the top 2 times 2x times the derivative of uh, times just the bottom, x squared minus 4. Subtract the top times the derivative of the bottom. Okay, now we're talking. Let's go ahead and sort of start over with our um, factoring. I apologize for that. I was getting myself confused as well. So our common factor now does take on a completely different appearance. It would just be a 2 multiplied by a 2x. OK, in that case, then x squared minus 4 is left in the first piece. Subtract. Now, you got to be very cautious here because you have an x squared minus 9 that must be wrapped in parentheses so as the, to allow the minus to distribute through. 
And our denominator is still x squared minus 4 squared. And I'm going to go ahead and use the space over here to the right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and multiply the 2 and the 2x together. No harm with that. And I'm hoping that we can all see that the contents of the brackets would just be a positive 5. These x squared terms would cancel out, and then, of course, a negative 4 plus a 9 would be a 5. And then we get ourselves to a point where we've got a pretty clean-looking first derivative of 20x over x squared minus 4 squared. So now it's time to find our critical numbers, the critical numbers of the first derivative. Hopefully you recall from that portion of your course that critical numbers are defined wherever the derivative would be equal to zero. Well, the derivative is equal to zero whenever the numerator only would be equal to zero in the case of this rational function. So you would have an x equaling zero as a one potential critical number. And the other positions of your critical numbers occur when your derivative is undefined. Well, the derivative f prime is undefined whenever our denominator is set equal to zero. And the denominator here would be obviously equal in the case of x being two or negative two. And if you're thinking about what's going on as you're working through the problem, hopefully you remember the fact that, um, hey, we found two vertical asymptotes at x equal two and negative two. Well, Asymptotes are very good spots where a derivative would be undefined because you've got to think about what a derivative is. It is a, a slope of a tangent line, and if you can't draw a tangent line, which is very, very difficult to do at a vertical asymptote, in fact, impossible, then you probably have a first derivative that's undefined there as well. So now is the part where some teachers do things a little differently than, than perhaps the way that I do these, and that's fine, but um, I would like for my students to kind of put together the the chart in the way that we've discussed it in class where you use the words interval, test, sign, and conclusion. What this does is it really organizes your work very well. It makes things easy to locate. And then we could draw our lines. I'll use the magic of the smart board here to draw my nice horizontal lines. And then we take inventory of the fact that we have three critical numbers, 0, 2, and negative 2, which means we'll have a total of four intervals once all is said and done. So our chart could look something like that. <clears throat> For our interval work, we know that we can start at negative infinity. And we can go to our, excuse me, we can go to our first critical number, which would be negative 2. Pick up where we left off there at negative 2. We'll go to our next critical number, 0. And then 0 to 2, 2 to infinity. Now, as I'm doing this, I'm being a little reckless in the fact that I'm not thinking back very clearly to what our discontinuities were, what our domain restrictions, I guess, were. But once again, that, that tends to take care of itself in the chart. But... Um, it wasn't too long ago, I, I suppose, that we did find the two discontinuities that were going on. We're at 2 and negative 2, so we have those sort of taken care of anyway. Um, now in our test, I'm going to scroll up just a little bit because I don't want to lose track of what our first derivative is. So you might want to draw your attention over here to this expression. That is our f prime of x, so when we do our test, I always like to choose a number somewhere in our interval, negative infinity to negative 2. Got lots of options. You could try negative 3. And I tell my students, it's really your goal to convince me what the sign is going to be. I don't need to see an exact answer. You know, you could just simply do some arithmetic very quickly, like negative 60 would be the numerator, and the denominator would be 9 minus five, 4, which is 5, and then squared. And I know that's going to be 25, but I really don't care what 60 over 25 is. I care more about what its sign is going to be. And of course, that is negative, which then leads us to the conclusion that this function on that interval would be decreasing. The f of x function is decreasing. Remember, this conclusion is talking about the behavior 
of S, the behavior of the graph of F, not to be confused with the behavior of F of X, uh, F prime of X, I should say. All right, we're going to continue the same idea, picking test values. Negative 1 would work nicely on this interval. Uh, in that case, I would have negative 20 divided by negative 4 quantity squared. Now, be very careful there because you're going to have not two negatives canceling out, but one negative in the denominator going away and the negative in the numerator sticking around. So we have back-to-back -back negatives. That doesn't happen very often, but it is definitely possible. Going back up so we can see the function here once again. We're going to try f of prime of positive 1. As you do your test, please, please make sure that you don't forget to put the little prime marker after the f. When we plug in positive 1, we have 20 over negative 4 quantity squared. Uh, you know what? I'm, I just noticed I made yet another mistake. Luckily, it didn't affect a lot of the results, but um, I kept thinking I'm plugging in 1 and not 0. So I think these two guys right here should both be negative 3 quantity squared. Am I right? In any event, they're both going to turn to a positive, so our conclusions are fine. In this case, we're going to have a positive result for f prime of 1. And a conclusion of increasing. And one more time, let's see if I can get this one right, f prime of positive 3 would give us a positive 60 over 9 minus 4, that's 5, 5 squared. Certainly looking at a positive answer in that regard. So I could say that we are increasing here as well. And you've got your very nice chart put together. It's so easy for a teacher to see, hey, on what interval is it doing what behavior? And we all would like to see this. And we can then jump very quickly to option or uh, topic seven here, finding the relative maximum and minimum values. Perhaps you recall that those would occur when a graph a conclusion of f of x changes from decreasing to increasing or vice versa. In this case, we do change from a decreasing to an increasing. It could look something like that. So that would uh, alert you to the fact that you've got yourself a relative minimum. A relative minimum, we can abbreviate rel min, would occur seemingly at the x value 0 comma something. Now in order to figure out the something that goes along with that x value, be very careful. You don't want to plug in that 0 into f prime because that's probably going to give you 0 right back again because that's where it came from. You would want to plug that 0 back into the original function. And if this sounds a little familiar, hmm, did we let x be 0 earlier? Well, we certainly did. That was part of our analysis of finding the position of the y-intercept, in which case we got 18 fourths, which is the same as 9 halves. So it seems like we have a point that's performing a little double duty here. The point 18 fourths, or I'm sorry, 0 comma 9 halves or 0 comma 18 fourths is serving as both the y-intercept and the relative min. And we'll definitely see that take place when we uh, sketch. But we're not quite there yet because we just have a couple of more things to do. In 8 and 9, you're asked to find the intervals of concavity, as indicated by the test for concavity, and any points of inflection. Well, prior to doing that, I'm going to have to take a real quick peek at my first derivative, which was right here, 20x over x squared minus 4 to the second power. So if you will allow me to, I'm going to rewrite that. f prime of x, 20x divided by x squared minus 4 squared. There's a variety of ways that you could take this derivative. Um, I'm going to stick with the quotient rule approach. Some students may elect to bring that denominator up to the numerator with a negative 2 exponent and work from there. But I'm going to stay as we are and see where it takes us. F double prime. Well, the derivative of the top is 20 multiplied by the bottom. Now we subtract the top 
and we're ready to multiply by the derivative of the denominator. Now this is going to be a little trickier than before because we have to now use the chain rule since we have a quantity squared, x squared minus 4 squared. So we'll bring that 2 out in front, put parentheses around it, multiply by x squared minus 4 now to the first. I'll put the 1 just for emphasis, but the big part of the chain rule we mustn't forget is the multiplication of the derivative by the derivative of what's inside, which in case would in this case would be the 2x. And all of this would be placed above x squared minus 4 to the fourth. And there's your second derivative, albeit unsimplified, which means we have a little bit of work to do in order to try to extract some values from this that will be helpful. So if we look through this very carefully, we would find that we could factor out, well, there's a 20 here and a 20 here. That would certainly be factorable. And then in each case, we have an x squared minus 4, but a second power and a first power will only allow us to factor out the first power version. So if that's the case, then all that's left from the first term would be an x squared minus 4 to the first. We're taking this power down 1. The subtraction will drop right in. Now remember, we factored out this 20, and we factored out this x squared minus 4. So all that's left would be uh, the things that I'm going to underline here in red, which would make for a 4x squared, I believe. And we're getting very, very close to having this simplified in a way that we can, with which we can work. Uh, we can do a couple of things here. Um, I'm going to cancel an x squared minus 4 to the first with an x squared minus 4 to the first in the denominator. So I've got now an x squared minus 4 cubed down below. And then I'm going to replace these brackets here with parentheses here. And if I simplify what's inside, I end up with negative 3x squared minus 4. And I think that's probably as good as we're going to get our second derivative to look. That's going to now allow us to, to go after what I refer to these as critical numbers of f double prime. Different teachers will say different things. Different textbooks will say different things. Uh, we're still going to be looking for positions, you know, where the second derivative is equal to zero because when we have changes of signs around that, then that could be potential points of inflection and whatnot. And then, of course, the idea of the second derivative being undefined might seem a little bit uh, redundant because we've already sort of established the fact that, and I'm going to take care of that right now, that if x squared minus 4 to the second was equal to zero from the first derivative, then x squared minus 4 to the third equaling zero is going to certainly yield the same values. So we'll kind of take those off to the side. But I'm more concerned with when this numerator is going to equal zero. And we could certainly uh, divide the 2 over, we could, or the 20, and forget about him. But you're going to notice something very interesting here. As soon as you add 4 to the other side and embark and, and upon trying to find uh, a value for x squared, you're going to say, hey, I've got x squared equal to negative 4 thirds, and that does give us uh, um, an imaginary answer. I tease my students, there is no i in calculus. Hey, spell it. And you'll find out that this just isn't going to give you any solution. I, I hate to say no solution because that's not really true. This does have a solution. It's a solution in the complex number system, but it doesn't have a solution in the real number system. So really, we did not get any, oh, I don't want to say any critical numbers from our second derivative because we certainly will use the concept of 2 and negative 2 and find out how the concavity changes about them. But we didn't have any uh, extra critical numbers from letting the second derivative be 0, of course. So once again, we will set up our chart using our typical verbiage. Interval. Test. Sign. Conclusion. And I know, once again, you feel free to pause or rewind because I am going through this very quickly. We'll build our chart. Difference now between our 
test for concavity chart and our chart from the first derivative is the fact that we have fewer intervals to worry about. Since there are only two critical numbers to deal with, I only need a total of three columns. And it would be nice if they were straight columns. So we're now ready to put together our idea of concavity. So we will use our first interval from negative infinity to negative 2. Pick up where we left off from negative 2 to 2. And then finish up with 2 to infinity. And let's see, uh, am I lucky enough to have my first derivative? Uh, first derivative is a little bit big, it's a, or a little bit high up there. So I'll tell you what, let's just do a little bit of a capture of it. And I'll slide it down here so that I can see it. Get rid of him. And it's really important, I probably ought to label this thing as f double prime of x. Okay, so f double prime of x, what do we got going on here? Well, we're going to test some values, and negative 3 seems as good of a number as any. We'll allow the numerator, the x values everywhere, uh, to be negative 3. So the numerator would give me 20 times negative 3 times the quantity negative 3 squared would be negative 3 times positive 9, which is negative 27. And then if I subtract 4 or more, I'm going to remain negative, so it's a pretty safe bet that my denominator, or my numerator, is going to be negative. Now the denominator, on the other hand, you guys can verify this, but I'm getting 5 to the third power. That's positive. So a negative divided by a positive would be negative, so I can say that my conclusion would be concave downward. I guess it's more grammatically correct to say downward than down. And uh, the conclusion here, just again to, to verify, we are talking about the behavior of the graph of f of x. We're going to do a couple of more tests here. Zero would be a great value to test. 20 times what will be negative 4 in the numerator divided by negative 4 to the third in the denominator. Once again, x became 0 in both cases. You'll find that you've got a negative divided by a negative, which would result in a positive, and a conclusion that would be concave upward. And lastly, we're going to check positive 3 in our second derivative. And if you think about this a little bit, given the nature of the two exponents that are attached to x, both being even, we should not see anything different from the result when we plugged in negative 3 back in this interval here. So you'd have 20, once again, times negative 27 minus 4, all divided by 5 to the third power, certainly going to be negative, and concave downward. So that brings us to number 8. If you recall, number 8, it's been a while since we looked at it, so we'll go back. And it says number 8 is all about you finding points of inflection. So if we go back and look at our chart, you'll remember that points of inflection will occur whenever we have a change in concavity. And it says, hey, it looks like we got two places where the concavity changes. Well, that is true. We do, do seem to go from a concave downward to a concave upward approach right here. And that would make negative 2 certainly a place where a concavity could change. And if, if a student were to say, well, that's exactly what I've got, a point of inflection at negative 2. Well, if we plug negative 2 or try to plug negative 2 back into the original function, which I've conveniently located here, we will notice that we've got something really bad going on in the denominator. Plugging in negative 2 for f does give us something that is undefined. And then perhaps that would jar your memory as the fact that negative 2 was a, uh, a value that was not allowed in our domain. 
and it actually turned out to be the position of a vertical asymptote. And I think that you would all agree with me, hopefully, that you get the same exact result right here, trying to go from concave up to concave down at the x value of positive 2. So if the seemingly two x values where we had points of inflection give us no results in our f of x, we'll just simply say that there are no points of inflection for this particular problem. And that is certainly going to be true. Now, <clears throat> how do you put this crazy mess together? That would be the contents of this screen, and this screen, and this screen, and this screen, all back together on the first screen, somewhere on this coordinate plane. Well, I want to identify some key points here. Um, hopefully, you've got this information still in front of you. I don't want to bounce between each of the screens. I'll probably just give you guys a headache if I do that. But if you recall, we discovered the fact that we had some asymptotes, or I'm sorry, some intercepts, and I'm going to go ahead and find those real quickly because that was a while back. Uh, 0, 4 and a half, 3, 0, and negative 3, 0. So I'm going to go ahead and sketch those right now. I'll use blue so it stands out very nicely. So here you can see that you've got three points. Hey, we're getting somewhere. And then we go back and we think about what other things did we notice. And we, we, we found that there were some discontinuities that led to these vertical asymptotes. And the vertical asymptotes were at negative 2 and positive 2. So I'm going to sketch those in with the typical dashed line. And then don't forget, I think we also had reasoned that there was a horizontal um, asymptote at positive 2. But recall, there were no oblique asymptotes. So that really takes us all the way down to here. And we're dealing with now what's going on with our first derivative test. Uh, well, our first derivative test, if you recall, and if you don't, I will quickly move to that area. We had discovered that our graph was always decreasing up until the x value of 0, at which point it began to increase. Well, that's good to know, but there's lots of different ways a graph can decrease. You know, a graph can decrease being concave down, a graph can decrease being concave up. For that matter, a graph could decrease by being sort of neither concave up nor down. Well, then we might want to put that together with the idea of our concavity, which I will fast forward very quickly to the second derivative analysis. And that stated that we were concave downward up until negative 2, and then we switched to concave upward. So that'll be the last time that I bounce around on the screen there. So if we want to go through this point, this x-intercept that we had already drawn, we want to be decreasing. We want to be concave down. Well, about the only way we could draw that is with that shape. And then you use the idea that, hey, these asymptotes, they're here for a reason, meaning that the graph should be getting closer and closer and closer to the vertical asymptote. It should also be getting closer and closer to the horizontal asymptote as we move out to the left. And we're going to get a shape that looks something like that. Next, you'll notice that we have to somehow go through this point 0, 4 and a half. And if you recall from your charts, I'm not going to show you them again, but if you look at your charts, you've got uh, a decreasing behavior until the x value was 0. Well, the only way that that's going to work out and make this asymptote do what it's supposed to do is by a piece of a graph that looks like that. And then you'll recall a couple of things. We do turn to a graph that is going to be now increasing. We should remain concave up if you look at your chart. And then we also recall that this x value, or this point right here, the x value 0, the y value 4.5, was indeed a relative minimum. And that would certainly qualify as a relative minimum, this problem. And finally, you finish off the graph from 2 to infinity. We are increasing, if you recall. We could either do it like that. We could increase like that. I suppose we could increase like that. But your test for concavity chart notes that we must be concave downward once again. So we will be concave down and going through this point and adhering to those asymptotes. 
Additionally, another thing that a student could do is reflect upon the fact that we did say that we had y-axis symmetry. This was an even function. And you notice here right along the y-axis that you've got yourself a nice um, mirror that would reflect the left side of the graph with the right side. But you put all of this together, you've got this pretty nice graph. Um, and if you're kind of curious, hey, is that really the correct graph? Well, I've taken the liberty to have graphed this on the TI Inspire beforehand. And this is indeed what we've got. Notice the position here of the relative minimum that is indeed at the point zero comma four and a half. And I think you'd all agree that the asymptotes, which I haven't sketched in, do seem to be in the proper places at y equal two, x equal negative two, x equal positive two. Like I said, very long example, I understand. But uh, that's kind of what goes with the territory whenever the directions to a question do ask you to analyze a function. Right, it's so much more beneficial to do these things rather than just blindly make a t-chart because you really get to understand a lot of the algebra and calculus behind these functions. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.